Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we're going to paint, well, a tank. But for a very interesting reason. Let's get into it. Uh, the strict technomancer that is Vinci V. Let us get to the technique and learn it Vinci V style. So if you followed along this channel you may know that Uncle Adam and I, well, we release games. And we've released three games before, Rain and Hell, Space Station Zero, and Majestic 13. We're going to add to our yearly releases with a new zine. Uh, a simple digital release uh, that contains both a small mini game and updates, additions, and additional content for our previous games. Our first edition uh, here is called uh, of Snarl. Our zine uh, has uh, supplementary information for Rain and Hell, as well as Space Station Zero, and importantly, has a brand new game in it. Uh, a mini game called Tanks for the Apocalypse. Uh, it is a skirmish game that you can play with your friends, where you each pilot a tank around in the post-apocalyptic 19-something question mark uh, wasteland of the United States. Uh, and everybody basically is driving around beat up, uh, kit-bashed M4 Sherman tanks. So today we're going to paint an M4 Sherman. Uh, and we're going to do this one pretty standard, as though it was more or less ready to be shipped out and is now uh, worn and weathered in the post-apocalypse uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, has, has seen better days. So we're going to go through painting this thing, you know, how we resolve more historical style painting, basically. We're going to be a little more subdued, uh, use lots of weathering techniques and stuff like that. So this one's going to be a lot of crunchy fun. Uh, let's head over the desk. Let's get into it. All right, let's paint a tank. Uh, we've got to get ready for tanks for the apocalypse. So we're going to start with uh, this nice dark green. It's a really nice military green color. We're going to be using the airbrush for these initial coats. This is really the purpose the airbrush was designed for in miniature painting. Uh, we've got these big, large, flat surfaces. We're just going to apply a nice, even coat over the whole thing. Now, if you don't happen to have an airbrush, don't sweat it. You can just use a large, flat brush, something we don't normally use in miniature painting, like the biggest, flattest brush you can. And you can often accomplish the same thing just by thinning the paint down and running it along there. But once I get a pretty nice base coat, um, I'm ready to go. Then I'm going to step up to olive green. Now, this is quite a jump. But we're going to do a directional lighting scheme here, uh, something fairly realistic. So we're going to only shoot from this one direction with just like I'm, I'm going to somewhat adjust because like the barrel is in the way and stuff like that. So I've, I've got to adjust a little bit. But for the most part, you'll notice I'm shooting towards the front of the tank. Now, I'm not worried if I over highlight a little bit, as you'll see me hit like the turret and it will be pretty bright um, from the overspray. That's OK. We're going to flatten this out in the next one. But we want to push that light towards effectively the front of all the panels. So we're not highlighting each individual panel. We're highlighting the tank as a singular volume, but then making sure that that light is pushed towards those uh, forward, upward facing areas. Um, but we're spreading out just little bits of it. Uh, we're operating really thin with these. Um, so this is about uh, three drops of thinner to one drop of paint here, uh, just to make sure we get a nice thin, even application. Once we've got that, then we'll put the two together, uh, thin it way down so this is five drops of thinner to one drop of paint. And then I'm going to come back in in the opposite direction and work up. And I use this to soften some of the olive green. You'll notice once it dried, it already softened quite a bit there. It's not near as bright as when it was sort of fresh and wet. Um, that's the thing with a lot of these greens. They do get, uh, they do dull quite a bit as they, uh, as they dry out. So, so don't worry if your initial colors seem a little bright. But I'm just going to use this to kind of smooth the transition and, and make those colors a little softer. Now I'm going to take my olive green and mix in just a little bit of green sky. And we're going to use that to do some edge highlighting. Now we're not going to go over the top here. Um, this is admittedly, uh, you know, a little bit more of a fantasy technique. But edges do catch some amount of light, especially on tanks, which do tend to have some amount of satin to some of the paint. The World War II paints for some of these tanks were a little bit satin. Um, so... We're just going to hit the upward facing angles mostly uh, for these these edges. So we're not edge highlighting everything. This isn't really like we're not trying to go GW heavy metal style here. But where there is an edge where it's quite clear and where it's upward facing or would have be catching some amount of light, we'll hit it with a little dab of that edge highlight. And, you know, the nice part about this is just as with all the other greens, it will um, it will dull down and become quite minimal. We'll also dirty it up a little in later steps. 
But I do find this to be still an important step. We want to be thin. You see I'm using the side of the brush. I have very thin paint here. Uh, so it just wicks right off the brush onto the, uh, onto the tank. It, you know, it just creates more alternations of light and dark. And these kinds of edges, especially even if it's just these upward facing ones, will just increase the readability of the overall miniature as it creates, uh, you know, more edges that your eyes can recognize. Uh, once that's done, we're just going to take and start picking out a few of the details. This tank has, you know, little things attached to its hull, like the shovel to get it unstuck and axes to get rid of tree chunks and stuff like that. So, you know, those halves are going to get turned brown. I'm also going to turn the uh, sandbags here uh, that are above that. Those are little additional sandbags that I added on to the, the tank. Um, when looking at the, I was looking at a lot of reference pictures of these tanks and I noticed that they often had extra sort of things attached, uh, you know, either up armored or that the crew would attach other stuff to it, assumingly for, for, um, you know, utilitous uses, uh, as it was in the field. Um, but I want to turn these sandbags brown so we can eventually turn them white. We want sort of a brown color in between that. We want to pull out that rough texture. Um, then we're going to go ahead and get out our rubber black, one of my favorite colors from AK. Uh, I'm just going to black out some of these little details just to make sure that they're, it's nice and edged. They'll end up being metallic in the end, but I want to cover them completely in black so there's a nice little uh, edge and shadow there over the thing. I'm going to do the same with the gun barrels. Uh, I also do the same with uh, the, the little mini gun barrels on this thing, not the, not the full gun barrel. In looking at reference photos of these tanks, uh, they were mostly just this green. Uh, like other than the uh, spray paint that's on the side, which we'll do later as decals, um, you know, and, and realistically the treads themselves, these things were basically just spray painted green. Uh, well, I assume they just like power spray this entire thing. Uh, now we're going to use some Tamiya panel liner. Uh, I love this stuff for things like tanks and historical vehicles. It's really nice. As you can see, it's like unbelievably great and how fast it flows. Um, it flows just like an oil wash, but it dries in uh, a few seconds. Or, well, that's maybe a little fast. It dries in a few minutes. After about 10 minutes, this is completely dry. You can still clean it up with a Q-tip and white spirits if you need to. So, you know, it will, it will run and, and kind of flower out. Um, but... Basically, I'm hitting any recessed areas here to reinforce any panels or anything like that. This tank does not have a ton of panels, which is historically accurate. Um, there is a, several different models of Sherman tank, but um, some of the most common, the, the hull was basically sort of crafted as one very solid big piece and then set down on its frame. Uh, so we just hit all these places where there'd be shadows let the panel liner spread out, do its work, and give us those nice resets. If you're interested in Tanks for the Apocalypse, uh, or Snarl the Zine, the supplementary information for Rain and Hell and Space Station Zero and all of that, you can get the whole zine for only $8. It contains the full game, which can be played by 2 to 10 players. Uh, it's everything you need, well, except the tank, uh, for only 8 bucks. So it's quite a deal. You can find the link for that. Uh, down below. I've also got a video going up today that's uh, all about how to play the game. So if you're curious and you want to see this tank in action, I've got a battle report featuring this tank. So check that out as well. All right, so that uh, panel liner is all dry. I cleaned it up and wiped it up wherever it was, uh, wherever necessary. You'll notice it leaves a little bit of like somewhat staining. There's going to be finish variances here, but it doesn't really matter um, because we're going to varnish this whole thing. So we'll, we'll bring it all in line. Uh, now I'm just really like rough dry brushing some white over those things and we're good to go. Uh, once the sandbags are ready, it's time to move on to decals. And for that, we get out our micro set. That's what I'm wiping on here right now. And then we watch and laugh as Vince attempts to apply a uh, decal on camera while holding this tank within the area of focus in a very small space. Uh, this is not an easy thing to do. And uh, I nearly screwed it up and then at miracle at the last moment I pulled it out. So yeah, just apply the micro set quite thickly to the area. And then uh, after letting the decal soak in water, um, we just stick it right on there. So I made my way around. Um, I did a second layer of micro set over every decal 
let that dry. Then I get out the micro sole as the second step. Some people don't believe in micro sole. I really, really do. I think this stuff does magic. Um, micro sole softens the, the decal and really works it into the body um, in just ways that I, it just otherwise doesn't. I don't know how to explain it. But I put two coats of the micro sole on every decal, letting it dry in between each application. Once that's done, we're then going to varnish the whole thing with a little mix of gloss varnish and for, for body and then ultra matte to matte it out. So that's two drops of gloss varnish to uh, six drops of ultra matte. And uh, then I just went go ahead and apply two simple coats of that varnish to the tank to even it all out. Now we need to scuff this bad boy up. Thus begins the weathering phase. Uh, so we're going to start by by sort of knocking around some of these decals and integrating them more. So here I have a mix of the dark green and the olive green. And rather with, with rather thick paint, like I don't have much water in here at all, I am just dabbing little dots and scratches and hashes and, and, and such into... Uh, various points on the decals. So you can see I'll cut in from the outside, I'll make little scratches across the surface, and I'll basically just, uh, and you wanna work darker than the area that's around it because you will never get it to match exactly and it won't matter a bit, but it does need to completely cover the lighter colored decal. That's what's important. And so you wanna work a little darker than the surrounding midtone and it's so small, it will blend into the eye. People will not be able to tell. Do not worry about it matching exactly. It will be fine. Just make it darker, make it opaque, so it covers the decal. It will look like it's a chip out of it. Now we're doing some classic sponge weathering. Uh, this is just a torn up piece of clamshell sponge, uh, and then a dipped in a little bit of Rhinox hide, then wiped off a lot. Um, the important part about this is to wipe, 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 wipe so much of this away and just then dab it, dab it, dab it around. You gotta dab it a lot, a lot, a lot. It's always better to start with lighter dots, more random dots, and, let it, and then just build it up, build it up, build it up. Then we're gonna go in with a brush and we're just gonna reinforce some of that uh, sponge weathering. The sponge weathering will produce very random patterns and you wanna focus your dabbing in the places where there would naturally be damage occurring. So you shouldn't evenly disperse your sponge weathering over the entire surface of the tank. That's not realistic. This tank would be hit and chipped more in certain areas. Edges, the front of the tank, uh, wherever the wheel wells are gonna kick up rocks. So like wherever it would naturally scrape against things, so the front of the armor. All of those things that are more likely to come into contact with foreign objects are more likely to be scratched. And so we're gonna reinforce that here and create more actual lines with the scratches. You'll see me trace these lines, but they're staccato. They're little stipples of lines where we're just extending out and drawing out the feeling that something big hit here. So once I have some lines and chips uh, worked into the whole thing, um, I'm then going to go ahead and apply some simple streaks. I'm actually gonna use contrast paint for this. You can use oil paints or, or enamels or a hundred different things, but good old fashioned simple acrylic contrast paints dry pretty fast. If you water them down or use a uh, contrast medium or anything like that, you can thin them way out and create different thicknesses and, and such of the streaks. But just a super thin brush, some fresh contrast paint. We are focusing the streaks on originating from wherever the heaviest chips and rust and, and dings are in the paint as well as on edges or places where water would naturally gather and then run and streak down. So if there's any place that would be a natural water catch, like the where two metal joints meet, that's where we put a streak. It's also important to streak over top of the decals as that will further integrate them into uh, the tank and make them feel like they're part of it and not a decal sitting on top. So you'll see I have lots of streaks running over top. That combined with the damage, combined with the varnish, makes them feel like they're really part of the just natural paint that's on the tank. Once that's all done, it's time to get in there and get some uh, get some some dirt on these here tracks. So we're going to use a, a sort of red brown kind of thing. Uh, Tanks for the Apocalypse features a you know sort of post apocalyptic burnt earth setting due to a mishap with a, a the the first nuclear bomb that goes off. And so we're going to work in this red-brown uh, earth all throughout the, the lower parts of the tracks. 
I'm then just gonna take a clean brush with water. Now it's sort of bubbly because my um, my paint cup water has a little drop of, of uh, or drops of like flow improver in it, like soap. And so that kind of will we'll move it around. That's actually only helpful to us. Don't worry, the bubbles all pop and dry. It's no big deal. But I use the water to just spread it around. And then I reinforce again, once it's spread around uh, into that space. So the water helps it run and seep into all the recesses. And then I use a second coat to sort of apply it more strongly down in the very like bottom bases of the treads. I also take a more light brown pigment. So this is not the red of the earth, but a little lighter, more brown, more dirt, dust, debris, detritus. And I just sort of randomly dab that around in just a few places on the top of the tank where I think dirt might naturally gather. So again, where two areas meet, such as the side of this, that was way too heavy, but it's okay. It's dry pigment. I just wipe it off later. Um, basically anywhere where I think there might be a, you know, some water that would gather. And then when it dried, it left behind some staining and dirt. It's a great way to create this sort of effect and create more tonal variation across the surface of the tank. With that all done, I gave it a quick varnish one more time just to lock all of the pigment in. And now it's on to the metallic paint. So we won't varnish again after this step. Um, and this is just a quick application of Vallejo Metal Color Steel through the brush, nothing too big here. There's not many elements on this thing that stick out. I end up doing the little antenna in steel just for some kind of variance rather than being in the green. Um, I don't know if this was traditionally actually green, um, but it you know, seemed like a fun little thing to, to turn metallic. I also turned this very small gun barrels metal. Um, the large gun barrel was definitely still green in all the reference photos that I saw, but I figured the little guns are meant to be like, you know, little guns sticking out. And so uh, of the portholes that they very well might have a metallic color to them. Um, we want to dull them down a little. So just some quick applications of null oil onto sort of the back of the metallic parts and the bottom of the antenna, just to add a little bit of tonal variation, nothing too big. Um, you know, the same thing with the shovels and the metal parts, just to separate the elements, create a little bit of, of just visual movement on there. Again, we're being very minimal, um, but that with that last step applied, that tank is ready to go. There we go. Our tank is all ready to roll. Uh, we'll say this is my good guy tank. I'm doing a couple of them, and as I mentioned, you can see in the battle report if you want to understand how the game plays. Adam also has a video on his channel with some very brief explanations and overview of the new game. Uh, the new game is a little more than 20 pages. It has everything you need for 2 to 10 players to sit down and have a quick, fun, really, really explosive game of tanks for the apocalypse. Uh, so, are you going to be a good guy or a bad guy? That's for you to decide. Uh, but either way, uh, thank you so much for watching this. I really appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed uh, this and it gave you some ideas for painting up your own vehicles, whether they be for Tanks for the Apocalypse or for any vehicle you have me painting for any game. If you liked this, give it a like. Subscribe for additional hobby cheating. We have new videos here every Saturday. If you want to support the channel, hey, you could go down and maybe pick up that zine and get a new game and... Uh, supplementary information for the previous two games. If you don't have those, well, you can find those two on our website. All of that is linked down below. If you want to support the channel in other ways, there's a merch store down there. There's links to Amazon where you can pick up your hobby supplies. Doesn't cost you anything extra, but gives a nice kickback to the channel. And of course, if you want to go all the way, uh, there is a Patreon down there focused on review and feedback and taking your next step on your hobby journey. We'd love to have you as part of the community. As always, though, I thank you so much for watching this one, and we'll see you next time.